Welcome back, everybody, for the uh, continuing of the program of lectures in this fine auditorium. And I'm going to introduce to you Franck Fournier. Franck Fournier is born in saint Sever, France, and he has been a photojournalist and a New Yorker since October 76, 1976. Deeply humanistic photographer, Concerned by social and political issues, he has produced extraordinary work on the civil war in Lebanon, the aftermath of the eruption of the Nevada del Ruiz, infants with AIDS in Romania, women rights in Sarajevo during the Bosnian civil war and the genocide in Rwanda, and the destruction of the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. He's been widely published in Time, Life, for whom he was a contributor, the New York Times Magazine, National Geographic, Pari Match, Geo, and Stern. And he won one of the World Press Photo Premier Awards in 1986, News Photo of the Year, for his coverage and portrait of Omaira Sanchez, a 13-year-old victim of Nevada del Ruiz volcano eruption in Colombia. He stayed with her all the way till she passed away. He remains one of the early members of Contact Press Images, and because of his longevity background as a humanist and his reputation as a strong street photographer, master photo printer, he's a regular instructor at the International Center of Photography in New York City, and a mentor also for students in the south of Bronx. Exhibited in many museums and galleries, his work can be found in museums and private collections. He's here for you, Monsieur Franck Fournier, s'il vous plaît. Good afternoon. Despite having camera in my hand and on my shoulder, I was asked at time, what's your job? With stupidity and arrogance in my younger professional years, I used to answer, feeling the trash. After all, it's where the magazine ended up. It took me a few years before I started to perceive the sanctity of the image, the power of transfer of photograph, his hidden seam and feeling that rise to the surface, his power on the mind of people, and the dominant domino effect a photograph can have. Once, I w once while working in Arizona, I took a photo of Fufi Arlon, a charming, healthy, 80 years old grandmother doing a split on a bus stop sign. I did not think much of this picture. However, before the magazine landed at the bottom of the waste basket, a photograph of that shoot escaped. He flew away he take a, to take a, a rich and long life on his own. Sometimes photographs do that. Mrs. Allen was a was part of a cheerleader group called the Pom Pom Girl, all in the 80s. This photograph became the ticket for a week in Paris to perform on a Sunday afternoon on a French television show, which of course triggered further interest in other European television. A club in her name was created in Japan, and its member flew once a year to visit her. When advertising executives saw that picture as a poster in the window of a double D bookstore on the Fifth Avenue in New York City, he made her the spokesperson for a large medical insurance company, flying her twice a year to New York with a contract that included limousine, Plaza Hotel, and a star treatment. When National Geographic did their issue in Arizona, they felt obliged to include their own version on Fufi as she had become a state monument. I could feel more than a couple of pages of significant events that Fufi Allen, this ambassador of happiness in aging, appointed by Vox Populi, became part of the life of many. All that because of a photograph for which she, had, she was the author. The best photographs are often a gift of your subject. It just happened that one was holding the camera. 
Besides being gratified by her generous and wonderful friendship, Fufi's skill and exceptional personality woke me up to my duty with the infinite and complex reach of a photograph. Even when his integral power sometimes gets out of my hand, like your children some, that you raise and protect, and protect, photographs take a life on their own as soon as they leave home. People within the same country, within the same culture, can see the same photograph in quite opposite way. Remember one of the best known photographs of the Vietnam War by Eddie Adams. He represents Henry and Van Lem, a Viet Cong, during the Tet Offensive being executed at close range by the Henry and Noc Lon, then the colonel in charge of the Saigon police force. When the next day this picture got published across America, half of the country felt we should do the same thing to all the Viet Cong. The other half of America wondered what kind of business America was running in Vietnam. Americans also started to question whether they were the good guy. For Americans, the picture also, the picture also revealed that the North Vietnamese were stronger than the lie of our government wanted us to believe. But for the South Vietnamese, he conveyed the exact opposite. Often it is said that this picture contributed to turn around American policy in Vietnam. 30 years later, America had a similar approach in Afghanistan. In that sense, that American soldiers were having just as much contact and understanding of the Afghan people and their culture as they had with the Vietnamese. Maybe because for America, winning or losing a war seem inconsequential and not part of the equation. It took peace, not a war, for the American to bridge and to appreciate the food, the culture, the art, the business, and the skill, or the friend and the friendship of all the Vietnamese people. Constant exposure to tragedy and death erode my understanding of who I was and who we were, forcing me to look for answers. Seeing innocent torture over and over, such a death appears a better part to escape endless violence and injustice. I ponder my journalistic approach. I worry if, I, if my work was contributing to perpetuate the intolerable. Recurring question guided my quest. Resentment waited on me, pushing me to bridge the gap between a will to know and a genuine understanding of reality. Experience and fact bring not only knowledge, but also responsibility, born from the bond of trust given to me by the people I met and the lands I traverse. Journalism in its intensity and its ability to understand, to bridge and to share, fulfill one's life in the most rewarding way. It makes one passionate. It makes one aware of hidden riches. Journalism goes beyond any work I know because of the solidarity and the communion attends through witnessing. Sharing the life of others is one of the greatest gifts life gave me. I came to see that history had not occurred the way I was taught it had. It did not happen because of the noble reason our democratic nation claimed to be motivated. When I talk about liberalism, I do not refer to the left wing of the Democratic Party, but to the political ideologies that developed in the 17th to the 19th century in Europe, in opposition to the doctrine of monarchical absolutism, natural socialist state, or inherited statute. Liberals believe in the rule of law, limited government, individual equality, equal rights, and democratic consent. One of the American founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Or the principle born from the French Revolution, 
liberty, equality, and fraternity. As we all know, there is a difference between what they claim and reality. Forget race. Think only of gender discrimination. For half of the population that is not and still does not have equal right in this Western liberal state. We should also remember that this Western liberal country, a former empire, Belgium, British, Dutch, French, German, Portuguese, Spanish, which is why the philosopher Charles Mills called illiberal liberalism. In this book, The Racial Contract, Mills wrote, white supremacy is the unpolitical system that has made the modern world what it is today. A contract that permits white people to violate their own moral principle in dealing with non-white individuals. Although some progress has been made until today, the executive of the United States, its legislative system, its judicial system, and the Constitution keep violating violating the moral principle of democracy we claim to live by. And of course, the same is happening in many other Western countries. We live in a world where justice equals vengeance, where private profit drives public policy, where the civil liberty of people of color are being fought in an endless war for the benefit of the same, and recently for the benefit of stateless financiers. The security of every other nation in the world is being subordinated to the comfort of the United States and a few Western nations. With the context of our mighty stream of news and entertainment, we confront real death and virtual death bound together by the same advertising. A photographer endures the stare of the other. He describes and reveals the joy and the pain that will stand the attrition of time. Unlike physical agony, emotional pain will remain. A photograph is born at the crossroad of a technical skill and moral humility, when the inner world of the photographer meets the outer world. Death is utterly singular for each of the victims. What is born with each life and what disappears with each death. Often these victims are flashed on our screen as a statistic, one about refugees, another for the wounded, another for the missing, another for the dead. But if they could, this human being will tell you that they do, belong, they do not belong to any of this category of statistics. A generous host, they will unveil who they are, their skill, their value, their joy, their preoccupation and their hope for their children which are the same, our own preoccupation. A desire, which is a desire for a good health and honest work. If you earn their trust and their respect, they will even share their past, their dreams, their culture. They will invite you into the land that they and their parents, and the parents of their parents have shaped with unconditional love and passion they will reveal their determination and their wisdom. The unique promise that each individual represents has been stolen from them and us. As we go beyond the challenge of the first look, we see their struggle, the imposing dignity of each of these individuals, their fight for the right to live with the faith in their culture, and the right denied, a right denied for them for our vile profit. The story that I am presenting today reappear in the news regularly. They aim to remind us that when we lose the dignity of the other, we lose ourselves. The denial of human dignity is our death threat. This essay presents the struggle of the, of the oppressed, the wretched, the damned, as we'll say, Franz Fanon. In exposing that fight, one builds a bridge. I exist because of the other. My responsibility for the other defines and structures my humanity. This responsibility for the life and death of the other constitutes constitute man's man, humanity and gives him meaning and transcendence. 
It is from this vantage point that this story is bound. The first story is of, in a former rich agricultural land of in a former rich agricultural land of Kopchamika in central Romania, uh, become notorious in 1990 for being one of the most polluted areas of the planet. General Secretary of the ruling Communist Party near Kola Ceausescu had paired inept Stalinist economic policy with a complete disregard for the health of his comrade worker. The primary motivation in exploiting this factory in such a despicable condition was the reimbursement of a large debt of more than $100 billion of all to the Western Bank. This Western Bank had imposed a right rigid term to the financially untrained marginal communist leader. To maximize profit, Chaussez could cut all corners, eliminating proper filtration system and any other basic protection. What unfolded was reminiscent of the darkest time of the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago. It will take decades for nature to retrieve its might and more than 100 years for the camion to disappear. Sorry. In this second story, on November 13, 1985, the volcano Nevado del Ruiz erupted. It is one of among 15 volcanoes in Colombia, South America. At the time, Colombia had no volcanologist and begged for help to the more experienced nation. That plea was ignored. One should add that Colombia was also facing serious internal political issues, as well as the fierce and deadly power of drug lords. The eruption caught over 28,000 people by surprise, despite a full year of warning sign. If common sense and if the technical expertise of the rich Western country had been applied, there would have been only a few dead, or maybe not at all. As later, many more uh, important eruption proved to be the case. Almost all the victims were within five to 10 minutes walking distance from the safety of surrounding hill. Indeed, for less than $200,000, they could have been saved, which is about $7 per person. Instead, the Western nation chose to spend millions of dollars after the eruption to drum up the technology and their arrogance. Of course, Western nations may not have deliberately wished the outcome, this outcome, but the strange economic concern pushed to take this stance. For three, day, three nights and three days, stuck in pool of water, of sewage water, at the bottom of small hill, her leg crushed upon layers of fallen wall, a voice rose to speak in the name of 28,000. It was the voice of an ordinary little girl who across lands and time will, who across land and time will bound and pierce the heart of millions of people. A commanding dignity, a stunning courage, and a relentless kindness, kindness during this oppressive and painful hour revealed more than ever the magnitude of every single individual. As the sewage water kept rising slowly to reach the level of her lips, 12 years old Omar Sanchez faced a slow, violent, implacable death. The cruel fate of, those, of this lost life, here but also in the other story, imposed to all of us to preserve and cherish the singularity of human life at all costs. 
no matter the specific mode of existence, the social and cultural condition. We need to challenge the vicious politic of life inequality imposed to, on the other by our leaders and by ourselves. It's not only a practical, but an ethical and political imperative as each individual has a right to life for the gain of everyone. So the volcano is, is in the cloud on the top left, and um, there was, it's very high, it has about 17,000 feet, and it's full of ice, and of course, as soon as the volcano burst, or uh, erupted, uh, the ice melt. Further down, there was a small lake, which under the weight of this uh, amount of water burst and everything went down with enormous boulder down this valley. It took about 45 minutes between the volcano eruption to reach Armero. Right after the execution of Romanian leader Ceausescu, many reports surfaced. They revealed a country in complete denial of reality as the heavy burden of the Western Bank loan had dramatic effect on the life of each Romanian. One of these reports focused on a crisis concerning children with AIDS. The infection was due to absurd medical policy sharing the same needle, injecting untested blood to make children stronger, odious national policy contributed to the aid pandemic. Mainly two hospitals took care of these children. One facility ward at the Victor Babesh Hospital was the ultimate fear and the perception that all these children were doomed to die guided the treatment. There was a total abandonment of this tiny patient who faced not only massive physical pain, but violent and, uh, and painful emotional suffering. About a quarter of the children should have survived and recovered from their illness. But their total abandon brought them to a state where all the normal facility stopped developing and even shrank, bringing the normal ch these normal children to the ultimate state of retardation. In the other facility, the virology and, uh, and infectious disease ward in the municipal hospital of Constanta, Dr. Radu Rodica Matusa and the driven dedicated staff of humble nurses used robust medical pragmatism and courage to give constant care and love to these children abandoned, abandoned by their parents and the women in society. In the process, they saved the life of more than 25% of the patient. They did it despite political pressure, the constant fear imposed by the secret police, but also with a total lack of medication, sporadic electricity, no spare part for bro broken washing machine, and much more. I mean, it, it seems like no big deal, but when you have to wash constantly the bed and the bed sheets and the clothes of these children, it's enormous work. They save about some 463 patients over several years. And the success of Dr. Matusha and her staff imposed, imposed them to find housing and education and even job. 
these women proved to be truly exceptional beings, deserving without any doubt the highest esteem for which, they, which for them was to see each of these baby growing, running, laughing, learning, working, even later marrying, and for each of them to enjoy the power of life. The, the women in the following photograph are all victims of rapes and abuses, torture during, and tortures suffered during the war in Bosnia. This war in the middle of Europe should never have happened. In February and March 1993, I spent time in Sarajevo with the help of a doctor and Sabrina Alacevic interviewed this woman. I apologize as a former here make difficult for their amazing testimony to be heard. For this woman, it was important to fight back to show they have not been crushed and they wanted to come forward. These babies were abandoned and some, and some of them had AIDS and they were uh, vic uh, babies from rape uh, children who have been raped. And this woman was raped while being pregnant by this uh, person who one is one of the rare person, if not the only one, who end up in jail uh, for s over 25 years. The conspiracy of silence, subterfuge, and complicity that surrounded the Rwandan genocide was a conspiracy of us. It is not only the people of Rwanda who were complicit in this crime against humanity, but we who, in our freedom, comfort, and security, sat by our screen and watch, and watch it happen, wrote David Livestros. It's a long and complex story that keeps evolving at times in, in courageous way at other unquestionable paths. A respectable and impressive route for the country that suffers so much and is limited by its side and its natural resources. This little girl, I'm not sure, I think she was around 10 or 11 years old, somehow managed to survive a massacre uh, where 50,000 people died. She was wounded with, uh, in the back. She had multiple time machete, uh, deep wound. And she escaped at night when the uh, people who, uh, who did this, Rwanda, uh, Hutu people did this massacre. And she escaped to the swamp and she lived in the swamp for three weeks. And every time, every night, all, every day, they were looking for her. And she hide with the, and she was able to use one of the small weeds and hide under the water sometimes, staying there for many, many hours in the water with the reed.
this was a camp um, made essentially of Hutu. And we ended up by feeding them, taking care of them after they did all the massacre. It's kind of irony uh, the way it was happening. In the United States, Anthony Lade, who was the national security for President Clinton, has organized a long, long debate over three or four months on what genocide is and how legally and in terms of word, what he means and what the consequence, all that was done to avoid to intervene after what happened in Somalia uh, with the Bush administration. Uh, they were all scared to get back. I mean, America, so powerful, was scared to go back to Africa. And it's pretty sad to see uh, what they did. On February 7, on, on February 4th, I'm sorry, 1999, in New York City, Amadou Diallo, 23 years old, unharmed, an innocent West African got assassinated by 41 bullets from the guns of four plainclothes police officers. Mr. Diallo was entering his apartment after a long day at work. The incompetence of the police is flagrant when we know that the serial rapist after which they were, was twice older than Mr. Diallo, twice his height, not from the same ethnicity. And he was known at the time, the rapist was known at the time to be working. The rapist had attacked 57 uh, black and color women. And of course, if that happened in the rich neighborhood of Manhattan, uh, after the first rape, this would have been stopped. Brutality, racial profiling, professional incompetence, fear, poorly trained law enforcement, and contentious shooting are still running high in the police of American city. Controversy related to employment, decent work pay, respect, and innocence due to any citizen represent some of the unfair uh, segregation confronted on a daily basis by black and many other minority in the United States. In the aftermath of that shooting, one more time those communities were forced to challenge the leadership of the city in the hope of generating a fundamental and lasting change. At the time, the mayor was the infamous Rudolf Giuliani, who had a national ambition. He used this out-of-control police force to show that he represented law and order. His, distributed, his, his disturbed incompetence convinced less than half of 1% of the nation in the next presidential election, but cost the life of many innocent people in color in the city of New York, destroying in the process tens of family, friends, and community. It's, it's an endless uh, story that repeats itself almost every week across the United States. These are the detective trying to uh, plead for and support the four policemen who were supposed to be arraigned. At the age of 31, Julia Tavalero, a young married woman, mother of one and a half years old daughter, had a series of mass massive strokes. Over the next 37 years, a person with quadriplegia, Julia Tavalero, endured ferocious pain, most inflicted by doctors, medical staff, or even by her own family. 
After a stroke that left her in the lock-in syndrome position, Julia got treated as a brain dead for more than five years. In reality, this young mother was very much alive, feeling, understanding everything. Totally paralyzed, she was unable to let anyone know that. Five endless years into this horrible emotional and physical condition, the uh, speech therapist dared to give her a bit of attention. She asked her the simple question, Mrs. Tavalero, can you close your eyes? This is when, through the movement of her eyelids, Mrs. Tavalero answered with the loudest blink, in reality the greatest scream for help. Five years after su uh, surviving the most excruciating and painful journey a human can undertake, Julia Tavalero was at last able to share and communicate. Somehow before this moment, everyone was too busy to try to connect with her. The simplest and most fundamental requirement for any human being was within reach. Cognitive, she has understood every single word spoken around her. Undeterred by her handicap, armed with the power of her eyelids and the fiercest will, Julia, the crabby, breathing dead, rebelled against all authority, parental, marital, the medical power of the hospital, all of them who stole her life. She fought until a right got respected as a human being and as a patient. Created in the deepest solitude, with that bitterness of vengeance, she shared her understanding of life through poem and a book. She wrote them, she wrote them mostly with her eyelids. And yet, in spite of all this most brutal challenge, Julia, armed with the power of her eyelids, flipped the script of her life. With the royalty of her book, she bought her freedom, liberating herself from the penal long system hospital ward where she has been for more than 30 years. She purchased her freedom and got access to a life filled with family and friends. This alphabet, um, you take your finger and you go every each letter, starting with A, and you go through each letter. And every time she, she goes through the letter, you stop at the letter G, and it will be, and you go back, she will blink. And then you will go back again, to the, and she will write the second letter, O. And she will go back again, and you will go to the third letter, good. It took, I don't know if you realize the amount of time it takes to write a full book at that speed. It's, and the effort required is enormous. Um, it took many times for this person to learn to swallow, to learn to move a little bit of chin so she could have her own uh, mobile cart and move uh, through the hospital. The effort required is just astonishing. When I remember talking to her and I would say, good morning, how are you? And she would never say, oh, I'm fine or okay or whatever. She will say, the sky is blue, so it will take, and I feel good. Good morning. <laughs> so it will take forever before you start the second question. But it was, she was an amazing person and wonderful to, to spend time with her. Let me finish with a story told by Toni Morrison. A story is an, when told in different cultures. The character could be an old man, a griot, or even a guru. So once upon a time, there was an old woman, blind and wise. One day, the, the woman is visited by some young people who seem to be bent on disproving her clairvoyance and showing her up for the faults they believe she is. The plan is simple. They enter her house 
and ask the one question, the answer to which rides entirely on the difference from them, difference they regard as a profound disability, a blindness. They stand before her and, and one of them say, old woman, I hold in my hand a bird. Tell me whether it is living or dead. She does not answer and the question is repeated. Is a bird I am holding living or dead? She still does not answer. She is blind and cannot see the visitor, let alone what is in the hand. She does not know the, the color, gender, or homeland. She only knows her motive. The old woman's silence is so long that the young people have trouble holding their laughter. Finally, she speaks, and her voice is soft but, soft but stern. I don't know, she says. I don't know whether the bird you are holding is dead or alive, but what I do know is that is in your hand. It is in your hand. The blind woman shifts attention from the assertion of power to the, instru to the instrument through which that power is exercised. She teaches how to see. Photography cannot, can never pin down injustice, genocide, or war nor should he yearn for the arrogance to be able to do so. Photographic gift is its, in its switch towards the unspeakable and to what goes beyond words. Tell us what it is to be a woman so that we may know what it is to be a man, what move at the margin, what it is to have no home in this place, to be adrift from the one you knew, what it is to live at the age of 10 that cannot bear your company. Thank you very much.